Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Guinan, and I'm introducing this workshop, uh, specifically looking at the role of the goalkeeper in build the attack. I'd like to introduce yourself, um, lads on the call. We've got Mark Mason, who is the senior women's goalkeeping coach. We've got Sam Meek, who is the men's under-17 goalkeeper coach. And we've got Matt Bishop, who is the UEFA A licensed lead, who perhaps you won't see, but he'll be diving around in the background and, and perhaps asking some really insightful questions to stimulate our discussions. So overview of this workshop, what we want to try and do is really give you an insight and share some knowledge with you of how the national teams operate in the men's and the women's game. Hopefully we'll break that down so you can understand it. And more importantly, how can you apply that into your own context? So just to consolidate on that, we're going to study some different approaches, systems of play, styles of play that the national teams face in the build the attack phase across all the varying age groups. So what is build the attack? As we uh, discuss and deliver these courses, basically it's the possession phase in the defensive third. It's the first phase of attack and it's an opportunity to retain and build, or is it referring back to the principles of play? What is your thought process as a coach in charge of your players? So what we'd like you to ask you to do constantly throughout this workshop is think about how it looks in your environment and how you can translate all the good information that you're going to receive it to your players. And we're going to start rolling through the slides and we'll tell you what it looks like in our own environment right now. So, Mark, I'll pass it over on to you. Do you want to give yourself a quick introduction and then you can fire away? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, so just in terms of, of my role, obviously already been um, introduced in terms of my current role working with the, the senior women um, as goalkeeper coach um, and, and previously having worked um, through the youth age groups on the men's side um, at the FA um, and also then but previous to that working within clubs from um, from foundation phase all the way through to professional um, and first team um, first team phases. So um, hopefully we'll try and give you a little bit of an insight into the England goalkeeper, but also relate it back to some of our club experiences um, and certainly what the build, uh, build the attack phase looks like um, for everybody from a club and international um, level um, and, and some of the similarities and perhaps some of the differences that we might find in both the men's and the women's game. So, um, just in terms of, of how we play, just to introduce, um, I suppose, the concepts and ideas behind how we work at the FA. Um, the England goalkeeper, um, looking at both on the men's side and the women's side, both follow this how we play model. Um, and it was something that was built over time by the goalkeeper coaches at the FA uh, with the outfield coaches, with the multidisciplinary team in terms of language um, and in terms of the types of actions that a goalkeeper has to perform alongside the outfield players in the game when building the attack. So I'll talk us through the how we play elements. Um, we have an in possession and we have an out of possession um, model. Um, and around that, then we have that transition, that support. Um, in between both of those phases. We're going to concentrate in this session on in possession um, and we're going to talk through initially um, support. So support for the goalkeeper in terms of the build the attack phase is really important. Um, obviously more, more, from a, um, more from a retain type uh, point of view. So as the ball, once the ball's been played, now how does the goalkeeper support? Where do they support on the pitch to provide the optimum um, position to receive and then play uh, to take advantage of the opposition's positions and the opposition setups? And obviously, how can we then gain um, territory up the pitch whilst doing that in the most effective form? I'll talk about some of the shorter passing options and the terminology we use. So we use um, we use the, the terminology play round. Um, and what I'd like to do when we're talking through all of these these options and this terminology is really related into, into, into your setting, into your world. Um, big for us, this terminology is, is all based on um, a common language that the coaches can use, the goalkeeper coaches, the outfield coaches, and the players whenever they're in our environment that they can use um, to really have a common picture um, and build the right pictures um, when everybody's talking and everyone's discussing the options um, that we're going to go to in the game. So play round. Again, if we're just picturing that from a, from a goalkeeper's point of view, 
Um, we're looking at the, the pitch in front of us. We might be receiving the ball off of the right-sided centre-back. We're looking at our support position to receive. As the ball comes to us, we've, we've scanned, we've looked, we've seen our option of the, the left-sided centre-back because we've got an opposition player pressing us from a central area. We're just looking to receive the ball and then play round to the opposite side. And all we're looking to do is just circulate to change that point of attack, which then we hope will give us that opportunity to then penetrate the opposition. Um, but the idea of it, that might be one in one move, it might be in a couple of moves. We might play the ball, we then have to support again, then we're looking to receive again, and we might have to play around to move the opposition to then create those opportunities to then play through potentially, which is our next um, our next part of the terminology that we use in terms of playing through, which is around penetrating passes and we're looking to play through opposition players. So if you imagine the opposition playing a 4-4-2, um, if they're quite flat as a, as a front two and they give you that opportunity to play through the line potentially to our four, um, sitting in the hole ready to receive and turn, it's an opportunity where we can take a line out of the game, an opposition line out of the game, um, and again, uh, gain territory up the pitch, whether that's the four turning and going forward um, or, the t the, or the four turning and then playing a pass. Now, it might be the four dropping in or it might be a four moving out. Uh, and the eight dropping into that space, depending on what on what shapes you're playing. And we're just going to go into a video just to give you some some visual um, some visual examples of this happening. Um, these are from recent senior women's games. So this is just an option of playing round. So here you see it with the right centre back. Now Mary's decided in this this uh, instance to to go back the way the balls come based on where the opposition player was pressing. So you'll see in the picture. Um, the left-sided centre-back's getting pressed as well. So she felt that the safest option in that moment was to bounce back out first time. So again, playing round the press, we're given now an opportunity to play forwards. Again, so, here, Mark, while you're just talking there, can I just, just yeah. confirm? So for the learners that are going to watch this and for their understanding, the play round is always in the, the, the defensive third. Uh, it, it's it's in the defensive third for the majority. However, as the as the play gets higher up the pitch, a big part of how we play, um, and certainly how we expect the goalkeepers to play, is in that pivot position. Okay. So we we'll talk about the pivot position, which if you, again, if you imagine the two centre backs, if the goalkeeper can play in that pivot position a little bit higher, it allows the centre backs to get a little bit wider, which gives us um, more of an ability to now push our full backs on. Sure. So. That could be in the build phase and predominantly in the build phase. But if we're playing higher up the pitch, now it might start to get in, into more of that create phase, that middle area of the pitch. As, the, as we're progressing up the pitch and the goalkeeper progresses up the pitch in support, it might end up being a little bit higher up the pitch. Um, okay. So, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely that option that we'd expect the goalkeeper to be able to change that point of attack at any point. OK, and, and just 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 uh, for curiosity and just to confirm that, if you're playing against teams and you're dominating the ball and dominating possession and they potentially may be forced into a mid to a low block, yeah. what sort of positions would you expect your goalkeeper to take up? How how high and advanced would you expect your goalkeeper to go? Um, again, it's, it would all be very much situational. Um, if, they, if they're really dropping into a mid block, what we're actually looking to do is is get more bodies up the pitch. Um, is to is to create more opportunities to play forward, um, but the nature of those mid blocks is that they're quite hard to break down. So the role now, if we're going to get bodies up the pitch, and like I say, we want to get our centre backs a little bit wider, but we want to maintain numerical advantage. Now the goalkeeper, if they can play higher up to become a, almost a three with the centre backs, um, now we can change the point of attack with with what we call control and patience. So it might not be that we can play forward straight away. If we're trying to break down that block, that goalkeeper is going to be really pivotal in terms of perhaps receiving and playing out quickly so that the block can't shift across quick enough. So now gaps, uh, gaps get formed and then we might be able to play through and find the nine. We might be able to play down the line into a channel for a, for a channel run. Um, yeah. But the idea behind it is that actually we can move the ball quickly with short, sharp, um, with short, sharp um, passes um, to to exploit the opposition in terms of moving them and creating space. Now, obviously, in all of that, there's over those shorter ranges, there's there's a definite requirement from our goalkeepers with their, their technical ability to be able to to play one touch, to be able to play two touch. The nature of these type of round passes being along the floor, um, most likely to be side foot in terms of receiving and punching. Um, 
but could similarly over bigger distances, um, say the fullback dropping in, for example. So if a fullback drops down the pitch and we can play round to a fullback, so we're not necessarily breaking lines, but we're playing round, um, it might be that that, that driven ball um, low into into the back foot of the fullback to receive to go forward, for example. So um, we see that position as being really important in terms of that pivot position. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Um, so just as the just as the video goes on, you'll see here again. Mary's made that decision just to check back across and play around. Um, and similarly, you'll see in the picture she could have played to the opposite fullback, uh, sorry, the opposite centre back, or could have played um, into the uh, the fullback. Sorry, guys, my video is not playing. So here we go. Now we're looking at those through passes. Again, you'll see Mary receiving the ball. Um, and, the, and in this case, it's the left sided centre back who stepped inside the pitch to receive in what would be a, like a four position. Um, and again, now we're looking to play through. Um, the, uh, Mary just punched it in um, to that left sided centre back to beat the press of the attacker who was quite aggressive in this case. Again, here from the position of um, defending the area to receive the cross. Now Mary's looking to break out. Now we see Jordan in that pocket there. And we're looking to play through to break that line. So break that defense, the, the, uh, the opposition's defensive line. So they're high press. We're looking to play through. Now Jordan's decided to play backwards in this case. Um, uh, in an ideal world, obviously, if we're receiving the ball in that situation, we're looking to go forward as best we can. Um, but again, certainly we're looking to break through those lines. OK, so next up, we're going to look at some of the, the longer range options. So our next part of the of the how we play is playing into. So, again, if we're thinking about this from a goalkeeper's point of view, this could be from a goal kick. Um, this could be this could be from open play. So certainly into we're looking at lofted type balls, aerial balls that it might be, for example, the goalkeeper receiving and then clipping into the fullback to receive the ball. And I'm going to show you a video example of that in a little bit. Um, it might be um, the goalkeeper recognising the opposition set up and recognising that the, the nine, who's a great hold up player, has dropped into a space between lines. So it might be between their back line and their midfield line and has got space to play the ball into them to receive it, to turn and then to play forward or to play off of. Um, again, the type of distribution or the type of technique that the goalkeeper might need to do uh, to, to use to, to play these type of into balls, more lofted type balls, um, more driven, but with a finesse, a real control in terms of the height, flight, speed of the ball. That's really, really crucial. I think whenever we're talking about these types of balls, um, really important we understand what it's like to receive that ball. Um, it's not just a case of I'm playing the pass and deal with it. Is I'm playing the pass with that finesse and care so that that player can really receive to make the next pass or the next move or the next touch really effective. Mark, I think that's a, that's a great point because I think from experience delivering on the A licence and, and being around some of the learners' practicals, I think quite often some of the balls that we see played from goalkeepers and even sometimes the back four, it's hit in a general direction of the receiver. But some of the detail you've gone into in terms of height, flight, speed, angle, the finesse you need, I think that's a really good insight and that's something that the learners would have to consider because quite often, if you've got a player in an advanced position and you're trying to play into, that ball speed and the actual accuracy of the pass is vital. And quite often, to give you and to exaggerate and consolidate on that point, if we see a ball played in the general direction, it's got snow on it and it's very slow, it gives the opposition time to go and squeeze and press off their first touch or even intercept the ball. So some of the detail you've gone into there is really good and, and hopefully will provide some of the detail required at the A licence level. Yeah, no, it's great. And I think that a common picture that we see when we're when we're watching games is a goalkeeper receiving the ball and playing into um, into a, a fullback who's playing off the line, for example. Now, actually, it becomes more of an onto ball, which I'm going to explain because their only option is to flick on because they're under pressure or to hook it on because they're under pressure from a pressing player. When actually we're talking about 
have they got enough space to the, uh, to receive the ball? So does the ball go to them? Have they got space in front of them where actually the ball can go to the space in front of them? Um, and what are the differences in terms of requirements um, of the goalkeeper to be able to play those different types of balls with different heights, with different speeds? The intricacies of the detail behind it are actually really, really key. Um, and I think as, as coaches, it's really important that we have the ability to recognise it and coach it. Um, that's That's really, really crucial. Um, yeah. uh, but also have the ability to to influence uh, the other coaches around us who might impact outfield players. Um, us have the ability as goalkeeper coaches to go and affect the outfield players in terms of finding the space, body shape, the commu- communication they might use to to connect with the goalkeeper in terms of going. I'm in space. I can receive the ball here. Um, so so those de- those bits of detail become really really important. Brilliant. Um, I think going on to play on to. Um, now, now this becomes really important in terms of um, the intricacies and the difference between playing into and playing onto. So we spoke about playing into being into someone to be able to control uh, and turn or control and pass. Um, we're looking at playing onto as the ability to now win an aerial ball to perhaps flick on. And again, I'll show you an example of that in the video. It's an opportunity to, to, to win possession. Um, by flicking onto perhaps um, a, a runner making a run off of their shoulder, for example. So I'll show you an example of, a, of of the nine coming in off of the front line to pull in their centre backs and then flicking on in behind for wingers to run in. So that would be one option. I think really important to notice on all of this that it's they're not just single movements and single actions. So it might it's not just the nine coming in to to, to win the ball. Actually, it might be the midfielders dropping down. To create, actually create space for the nine to drop into to win that on two ball. Um, so th- there's there's obviously patterns and movements that are really, really crucial in terms of space creation. Um, so if we're playing into or on two, um, if, we're, if we're playing uh, as a midfield three, what, what, what are our 10 and our eight doing to create space for our nine to drop into it? How are they, how are they moving and rotating um, to either give options to get on the ball or to move somebody to create space for a different different type of ball. So I think that's really crucial. We, we, we understand the connections between the lines and the connections between the players and all of this happening. Um, and then finally, um, play beyond. Now, this is probably something that we see um, we see less in the game of, but it's a really important um, it's a really important option to have. Um, we certainly see less of it in the women's game. Um, I think certainly there's there's um, physical requirements in terms of the ability to strike the ball over those longer distances, um, which are really important in, in enabling you to play beyond effectively. Um, we, we see we've seen some brilliant examples um, in the men's game, and, and we do see examples in the women's game. But it's something that I think progressively as we go forward, we're looking to really challenge uh, and make sure there is in that toolbox for the goalkeepers to be able to do. Um, so if you imagine the goalkeeper receiving the ball. And looking up and seeing a picture of a really high opposition line, we're going, there's space in behind. How do we exploit it early? Now, that isn't a bad pass. That's a forward pass, which gains territory up the pitch, which gives us potentially a goal scoring opportunity based on exploiting how the opposition are set up. So it's a really intelligent pass. Um, and again, I'm going to show you a video now um, of, of those, uh, of both playing into, playing onto and playing beyond. Uh, and we'll see some of the intricacies of that as we go. So here we'll see from a throw in. So now we're starting to drop back down the pitch into this build phase. And you'll notice now Mary getting pressed, the right sided centre back. Again, in terms of distances, it's tight um, with, with, with the Australian player pressing. But Lucy Bronze out on this, uh, this right back position is in acres of space um, and really fantastic from Mary to be able to open her body shape up in the way on her first touch that she does to allow her to now get in a good position to strike that ball into again with good height, flight and speed. And this is when we talk about the ability to control the ball. Again, Lucy's ability, brilliant there to get her body shape open. So her touch now gets her facing forwards. And that's really, really key. And then you start to see the options that are available to her. So she can play, she can play to feet here or now we're looking at that space in behind and she makes that decision to play forward into that space in terms of um, our nine running onto it and our 10 running onto it. Again, here in the recent Germany game at Wembley, um, you'll see uh, a a real, a high press from their point of view. Germany stopped us playing 
um, a lot of the time from our goal kicks. Now, you could argue in here that there are other options in play. We could play to the left-sided centre-back. We make the decision because of the, the numbers that we've got high up the pitch. So you'll notice in these um, around the, the halfway line, the numbers that we've got on, on our right-hand side, their left-hand side, um, uh, gives us a numerical advantage. So again, we'll see between lines. And this is the importance. We see we see Jill making that movement inside to support underneath, but the effect it has on their midfield put player, pulling them down slightly. Um, and again, you see Germany's back line dropping off. And what that creates is now that opportunity for Ellen. Now we're playing, we've played into Ellen to control. Now we're looking for support underneath where we can play and then switch play. Again, opportunity now we're talking about playing onto. So Again, you see against Brazil here, if they're, they're four in the back line um, against our four. So we've got a higher four here and quite a narrow four. Now you'll see, okay, Rachel Daly dropping in off the front line there, okay, with the purpose of pulling that central, that centre back in. So now we're talking about the height and flight of the ball becomes really important. So if this is a low driven one, it may get cut out by the midfielder um, screening in front of Rachel. OK, so it has to be the perfect height to now drop onto the head of Rachel to allow her to make that flick in behind. Now, what we're looking for are these, are these runs um, from, from the front players now to get onto that ball. Now, in this situation, uh, Brazil recover and get the ball back to the keeper. But the idea is playing onto to then play, play behind. Right, now we're looking at beyond. There we go. A fantastic example of a goalkeeper receiving the ball from a wide area, defending their goal really well, breaking a line. And when I talk about breaking a line, it means changing your position as a goalkeeper. So working at the 18 yard box to get to get through players to create space for yourself whilst doing that, getting your head up and having a look and scanning and seeing what options are on. Jordan's done fantastically well here in terms of recognising that space on the right wing. And then when you talk about technical excellence, now we've seen some examples of, of passing, we've seen some examples of, of throwing, and, and now we've seen this example of the sidewinder and the effectiveness you can get if you can get that right height, flight, uh, that the height, flight and speed right in terms of finding that space and giving, the uh, giving you, your teammate the ability to now be able to get onto that ball and run forward um, and recognising space. So um, just to see it in its entirety, um, again, I, I, I really think it's important to make the point that the, this terminology uh, has been formed um, for, for our teams to use um, when, our, when the players come over England. So it's really important in terms of those having the common language, common themes, that when we're working off the pitch, on the pitch, everybody has a really clear understanding of, of what it means and what it looks like. Um, now, going back into, into if you're watching your, your environment as a learner, so what does it look like in your club? Now, this terminology might be applicable to you. It might be that you have your own terminology. And the importance of it is, is that actually it's, it, it can be related to by the people within your club, the players within your club, the style of play that you play. Um, so I'd say that's really important. But what it really gives us is a, is a really good framework to go into, into, into our games, go into our game plans. We've actually, right, we're playing against this today. We're going to be playing against this type of press. Okay, what type of passes are going to be applicable um, for us to be able to instill our game plan on the opposition? Um, Thanks, Mark. Well, one thing I'd like to pick up on is that's a real clear picture to me. I can see that in front of me and that it's fascinating, all the different ideas and options. Um, the, the, the modern day keeper in the, in the men's or women's game, it's irrelevant that they nowadays hopefully will try and possess a variety of tools in their toolbox that they can use to at any given moment in the game, depending on the strategy and the opposition's tactics. And one thing you mentioned before about is is the difference in the men's and women's game and the physicality and that, and that yeah. play beyond option. Do you think that's going to become more prevalent in the women's game as we over the next few years and become more of a trend, if possible? Uh, and I, I think back to the when I played um, that play beyond stuff. It was always in behind, and I'd make runs in behind, although I was never the quickest. But it was always an option because what we did and what it, you're totally spot on. It made the opposition drop off. It was always giving them a thought: well, we can't squeeze too high because if we do, there's a ball on in behind. Yeah, yeah. and people do get caught up in. Uh, building the attack and playing out from the goalkeeper where it's heavily possession-based in that defensive third or even the middle third. 
but he never actually progresses into the attacking third and, and, and sometimes and more frequently definitely not until goal scoring opportunity so that is yeah. always an option and I always refer back to the Sergio Aguero goal at, at Wembley in, in the Capital Cup I think it was against Arsenal where where Bravo just zinged one quite flat over the top uh, Aguero just nudged the centre half and it ended up with a goal yeah and people think that Manchester City Liverpool they don't do that but but they do because if it's an option and it's on at any given time that's the quickest route to score a goal now I'm not yeah. saying that you know we've got to be very careful here that that's not a long ball we don't want to become a long ball team but do you think that's going to become more of a, of a trend as I referred to in the women's game I think um I think if you look at the point of view from a from a perfect world if you could have a if you had a goalkeeper who had all the tools to play all of those passes with with control and confidence um I, I think you'd grab it now you'd go yeah I want that goalkeeper so I think in your team if you've got a player who has the ability to do all those things actually they they open your ability to have different solutions for for different opposition um for different styles that you come up against um, to, 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 to instill your style of play on the opposition rather than be dictated to. So if I'm a, if I'm a team where the goalkeeper actually, they're, they're quite good at playing round, they're quite comfortable with their feet and they can play through quite comfortably. They've got that nice little finessed ball in, when they're playing into the full back or in, into the, the 10 or the eight maybe. Um, but actually they can't go beyond that point. So they, 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 they struggle to get the height to play on to, to flick on and they struggle to play beyond. What happens is, you start to find opposition back lines who go, I don't need to be this deep. I, I can go and I can go and press a little bit higher. So what you find is now you start having more battles and it becomes more combative in your half. And actually, you, you don't want that because now, now it's getting more intense. Now when I'm playing out, it's getting more pressurised. If I've got the ability to now go, I recognise that actually you, you've stepped high now. And you create you're creating lots of problems in our in our in our defensive third or in our build phase. I'm going to go beyond you because there's space there now. Actually, it's that cat and mouse game between going from a centre back's point of view, who's now dealing with those balls, going, I don't want to get beaten in behind me, so I'm going to have to drop off a bit. I'm going to have to buy myself a little bit more time and space. So the consequences they drop off. Now, if the midfield line stays high, now you've got that great opportunity to play between the lines. So it might be now I'm going to play. I'm going to play into a nine dropping in because there's space to do it. Um, if the midfield line drop off and there's a disconnect between my midfield line and, and uh, sorry their midfield line and their forwards pressing, I might be able to play through. Um, I might have the opportunity to play through more often. Um, and then if the now if their centre backs are dropping off, now it might be easier for me to play around. So I think if you can have. Um, all those solutions as a goalkeeper in, in your locker in terms of the tools to be able to do it, I think it's a massive, it's a massive attribute to have, um, and one that would what that managers would go. You know what I want in my team. Um, on the point around um, styles of play, um, I do think there's been this real theme around playing short passes. Now, um, the the purpose of, of the game is is to go and score a goal at, at the other end. Um, now, teams will have different styles and philosophies of how they're going to do that, whether they're going to, they're going to play forward as quickly as possible, which is, which is absolutely fine. That, that is a style of play um, and that, that's something that, that teams may adopt and do adopt. Um, there, there are teams that go, do you know what? No, we, we're always going to build through the thirds and we're going to, we are going to play out the back. Now, um, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later on as well, but what, what really happens is at higher pressure moments, those styles and beliefs get, get tested. So when you are getting higher pressed and you and uh, and you are one nil, uh, you, you are one nil up. Um, do you go? Actually, I'm not going to play riskier and I'm going to play forward, or, or do you know what? I'm going to stick to my beliefs and I'm going to keep playing and I'm going to keep progressing up the pitch. Um, or similarly, you might be one nil down and chasing the game. Do you now revert to actually playing beyond, playing onto, playing into because you think it's going to get you higher up the pitch, or do you go? Mm -hmm. No, let's stay calm. Let's 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 keep playing the style of play that we believe in. Um, and we're going to progress up the pitch with confidence in terms of our players' ability to get on the ball, turn and play forward um, and obviously maintain pos uh, possession and progress up the pitch. Now, I 100% believe, and we've certainly been in this situation from a senior women's point of view, where you have to be brave and you have to stick to your, your style of play. But it would also be naive to go that this is the only way of playing. So an intelligent pass like you've seen in, in in the clips that i've shown might be playing into the nine 
who's dropped into a space to receive the ball and turn. Now we're on their back line in their half. That's an intelligent pass. That's not kicking it long. So I think it's really important to recognise that actually um, a possession-based um, style of play doesn't necessarily mean in the you know short play possession practice that perhaps we see on the training pitch and we're going actually it, it might be over a longer distance and have our players got the the ability to one uh, technically carry it out in terms of their passing ability but two a receiving player's ability to receive the ball you know in the in the way that's required okay thanks mark cool so um Good evening. Hello, everybody. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about now is obviously Mace has been a great introduction to, to how we play in the England teams and the philosophy of, of playing and building from the back. But I'm going to delve a little bit more into the profile of a goalkeeper and more or less how he compensates all those areas of playing from around all the way up to going beyond. So the main aspects we're going to be talking about, this characteristic slide that you can see here now has 19 characteristics that obviously are in different areas and different sections, but we're just going to focus on on three of those areas. So the areas we're going to focus on in the technical aspect, you're going to see outstanding distributor. So having that ability to successfully execute a wide variety of passing techniques to get the ball to the areas that Mace has just alluded to and showing you some um, some clips on as well. And obviously having that consistency around being able to hit the ball there. So in terms of an England goalkeeper or goalkeepers back at your football clubs, if you've got a goalkeeper who is consistently very good at playing round but cannot consistently hit into, onto and beyond passes, you're going to be very restricted. You're going to be very restricted in terms of, one, how you're going to approach the game against other teams, but also you're going to play into the advantage of the opposition where they're going to be able to stop you playing what you're good at and sort of play onto your weaknesses. So definitely having that consistency around the different range of passes is going to be very important. Then we're going to speak about, obviously, I'm going to show you some uh, clips in a minute about the tactical side of exploiting space in possession. So not is it only important to have all the technical qualities, but it's also very important for the goalkeepers to recognise where the space is on the pitch to exploit. Mason spoke about all the areas of where we're going to play into, but if the goalkeeper cannot recognise where that space is and how to get the ball there technically, then you're going to fall down on, on being able to build out from the back successfully. So I'm just going to show you now in this video a couple of examples from our senior teams. Okay, so very important. I'm going to show you the structure and where the space is to exploit your possession. So this is now uh, Jordan Pickford from the seniors. Open play, to speak about the support and the areas that Mace has sp spoken about. But you can see here that the front three of England are really pinning the back four. The pin in the back, which means there's going to be some space created. The back line here from the defenders, they're going to create a bit of depth, which you can see here. And then the red player that I've highlighted, he's totally focused on jumping onto the fullback. So there's the space into Jordan Henderson. Now I want to see the trajectory and the flight and how he gets the ball there. Nice, low and flat. It's on his outside shoulder, so Jordan can really take that ball forward and play the ball forwards. This one's a really important one for me. So we talk about... I'm just going to pause it there just to just to give you a little bit more context. So when we're dis, uh, session designing, um, so prior to this game, this is a game against Germany. Um, I think this is an under-19s game. So when you're looking at this now, we're looking at the shape of Germany and we're going, okay, they're a 4-2-3-1. So they're going to be quite a narrow formation. And in the sessions prior to this, what will have come out in the sessions? Well, where we can exploit the opposition. So what you'll be able to see is how the setup of Germany. So I'm going to play it now so you can see the very narrow, and the player getting highlighted now is the right winger, uh, just now. He's the right winger, and he's quite narrow. So now we're looking at, they're all locked in one way. There's the space to exploit, and it's now how the goalkeeper is now going to get the ball there. Most goalkeepers, you'd be just happy to get that ball to the player. But that's not exploiting the space in possession effectively as possible. To exploit that space in possession, that ball is going to need to be in front of the player, so you can end up taking four or five players out of the game which we're going to see right here now with the, with the delivery. That nice trajectory, outside shoulder, into the space. Now look at the amount of Germany players rushing to get back in. Here's another example. So in terms of session designs, again, once we've been successful at playing a certain way, teams will often adapt and change. It's like a game of chess. If we've been successful playing out one way, 
they'll think of trying to set traps. So in this instance here, you can see Germany are trying to set a trap. What they're looking to do is they're looking to try and force you to play the ball to your centre half into a fullback, and then they're going to press from that way. And what's important here is the goalkeeper recognises right now. I'm going to pause it there. Look how back how that back line is disjointed. You can actually see at the top of the page there that our left winger is actually the other side of their fullback, which means that there's going to be a great opportunity. Germany are expecting the goalkeeper here to play the ball to the centre half. No, the space to exploit is beyond. And if this was a little bit of a better um, touch from the centre forward, we would have been in. But just look at the technical quality of the goalkeeper to get that ball straight to the centre forward there. And with a little bit of a better touch, we could have been in. Like I've just mentioned here, in this example, what I'm going to show you now, in this game prior to this, this game, we're, we're around about 40 minutes in and we've been playing around. So Mace really explained early on about playing around successfully. And this is Italy here. So Italy were quite a 4-4-2 a, a diamond, so quite a narrow shape. So we were playing around quite easily into the centre-backs, into the full-backs, and we were getting out. What they've decided to do now, they're changing. So what they're looking to do now is they're looking to try and stop us playing around, which you can see I'm going to highlight the players here. They're stopping us playing around through our success. So now the opportunity is to play into this player. Now, I stopped it there to show you the safe side pass. Again, the detail of the goalkeeper is going to, going to play this ball in, but it's not just happy about getting the ball into that centre midfield player there. It's thinking about how he's going to get the ball there and what the next stage for that centre, centre midfield player is going to be. So in terms of if he plays that towards his, the left side of the midfield player, towards the blue, he may have to just bounce that straight back or spin it around the corner. Instead, just have a look at where he plays this ball and the detail of where he plays it to. If I was being ultra picky on that centre midfield player there, what I would be saying is if he was a bit more on the half turn, he can turn, he can get out and we're out again. So in terms of going back to your profile of your goalkeeper, it's very, very important to think about, OK, we've got a philosophy. We're looking at playing around all the way through to beyond. It's great having that philosophy. But then what's, what does the profile of the goalkeeper need to look like? So there's there's another clip that we, we that we, um, we we can't show, but um, Jordan Pickford is a left footer predominantly. Now, when I spoke about being an outstanding distributor, if you do have goalkeepers that are outstanding on one foot, again, you're going to be restricted because teams at the highest level, players at the highest level, are going to recognise this and they're going to start to press you on one side, start to force you to receive the ball on your right foot. So when Jordan has to have the ball on his right foot, he still has the consistency to find the same type of passes with his right foot. And I think it's very important to speak about um, as you go through pathways with, with goalkeepers, they're going to be going through different systems and different styles of play. So if you've got a goalkeeper that, for example, is very, very good at playing out from the back, but not very good at playing onto or beyond, and vice versa, a goalkeeper is very good at playing the higher balls, but is not comfortable with the ball at his feet. What happens when different styles change? What happens then? Because the goalkeeper can only fit one style. So I can give you a, a quick example of um, a first team experience that I, that I have had in, in the championship where you could play a variety of different teams. We have three goalkeepers at the club I was working at and one goalkeeper is excellent at playing out from the back but can't play longer. Another goalkeeper is not comfortable with the ball at his feet and actually struggles to hit over the halfway line. Then the third goalkeeper can play 70, 80 yard balls, but is also very comfortable with the ball off both feet and playing playing shorter passes and through the opposition players. So all of a sudden, you're going to go with that goalkeeper because he's going to give you the highest success in possession that is going to ultimately lead, or hopefully ultimately lead to you being more successful with the outcome of that game. So in terms of the profile of those three, it was quite evident which goalkeeper we were going to go with especially when we were coming up with a variety of different opposition in the championship as well. So with all that, what I'm going to, th what I'm going to be thinking about now is just sharing with you um, an experience that I had um, at football clubs. I've been very fortunate and very lucky to work with, you know, nine year olds all the way through to seniors at two or three different football clubs. And now obviously joining across to the international team. So, what I think that could look like and what I actually did at one of the football clubs, I'm going to show you a sort of in-possession youth-to-senior model. 
So in terms of a club playing style, using the terminology that we use at the FA, I used the same terminology at one of the football clubs that we was at. So we we're talking about at the under nines and tens age group, really focusing on playing around and playing through. So what we were looking to coach were your supporting positions based on the offensive pressure. So based on wherever the striker is pressing you from, can you give an angle where you can support your defender and also think about where you need to make sure your next pass goes to? That is going to dominate your support position. The technical execution, so you've got a real good um, tempo over these two years to work on receiving skills, the different types of receiving skills from, from your goalkeepers at nines and tens, and also really drive home side foot passes and driven passes, even at these early stages. Fantastic opportunity to do this. You're still going to get some tactical decisions. So do they pass the ball first time? Do they need to take a touch? Do they play play the pass to the defender to their feet or do they go to, to space? And also safe side passes, which we spoke about, not just happy getting the ball there, but how are they getting the ball there, which is going to give their teammate an opportunity to play the next pass successfully. Then the rationale of why we, why we were coaching nines and tens to playing around and through and all, all the rationale at the top. Basically, it was laying the basic foundations to help dominate possession. It's quite simple. You start early, you're going to reap the rewards later on down down the line in in your in your clubs and your processes technical refining of first stages of receiving and passing um, the tactical returns you're still going to get that at an early stage without complicating it too much um, and it's worth noting they're physically able to execute these areas we can't get nines and tens expected to hit into and on two passes they're physically not going to be able to do it especially on the pitch sizes and the amount of players they've got so moving on from that we're then looking at when do we introduce playing to which is quite simple. As the players are slightly getting older, they're physically growing, you know, they can actually handle a little bit more tactical information. The pitches are getting slightly bigger and there's more numbers now getting introduced to the game. So what to coach? You still coach all the principles from the first stages of nines and tens. This never changes. The princ the technical principles never, um, never underestimate the importance of the technique of a side foot pass, the technique of a driven pass and how you get it there. You cannot neglect that at any age group, even through to seniors. Um, the technical execution, so now you're looking at clipped passes and curl passes. So playing into fullbacks or playing into little higher midfield players, again, you've got a different variety and a different range of pass now that one, they can physically execute, and two, we need to start developing into these players. Tactical decisions now start to um, get a little bit more ramped up. So do they play a pass into a fullback? Do they play it to his feet or do they play it on the full? Um, and also, do they go into space so they can take it forwards like you saw the clip against Germany? Or does it need to be outside shoulders so they can play quickly or, or flick the ball on quickly? And that's all based upon, again, the tactical decisions they're going to be faced with. Why, again, we're developing the next layer of the build phase. I've already mentioned we've got slightly bigger pitches and more players. It gives me more options. Um, the tactical returns are going to be enhanced, this time under more pressure because you've got more players. Um, and again, you're physically able to to execute these areas. Sam, just, yeah. just, just before you come on to this bit, it's um, intriguing for me this because I see a variety of people working within clubs, especially across the 9 to 10s, 11s to 12s. How, from your experience in working across those age groups, it'd be good to get your input, Mark, as well. What about accepting mistakes as a coach? Because players who are those ages, they're going to fundamentally make loads of mistakes at any position, not just a goalkeeper. But it's yeah. always referred back to the goalkeeper makes a stray pass. You can't execute it, whether it's through technique, whether it's through physicality, it yeah. leads to a goal. As they're starting to approach their teenage years, the peer pressure, motivation, morale of teams can suffer. Yeah. What do you do as coaches from experience? How do you build up that and stick with their confidence? So for the longer term benefit of the goalkeeper rather than the here and now? Yeah, I think it's a very, very, it's a great question, Steve. And it's, it's a battle that has gone on between goalkeeper coach, outfield coach, if you like, or, or, or academy staff um, for, for a long time. It's, it's what, what are you looking to get at the end of it? So if we're putting a, a programme in place and a process in place to get at the end of it, you know, 15, 16, 23 seniors, a goalkeeper that can play like Jordan Pickford. Jordan Pickford made loads of mistakes at nines and tens. He couldn't execute certain passes at nines and tens, 11s and 12s. So you have to have a balance of what are we in this for? So if we know we're in this to develop these type of players and these type of goalkeepers, we need to accept mistakes. But also, why, why does mistakes or why does failure have to be a bad thing? You know, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. 
it's actually you learn more from mistakes and failure than you do success. So the more and more you train these types of passes and you're not getting it right, it's like trial and error. Now you've got to refine your technique to make sure you do get it right and you've got to persevere with it. And you also need to have a bit of empathy with these players, especially these age groups, because the type of play we're talking about, we're talking about potentially giving balls away in dangerous areas that could lead to goals. The goalkeeper is going to need a lot of support. The defenders and the midfielders, if you like, they're going to need a lot of coaching around making it easy for the goalkeeper to find them with the options, but also not getting on the goalkeeper's back when he doesn't get it right, because this is what we're in it for. We're all in this to develop these type of players and dominate possession. So from my point of view and my experience, it's been very important to hammer home these messages and not get too tied up in results, not to get too tied up in, oh, we've lost the game because the goalkeeper can't play out from the back. But then you moan about it two years later when you say he still can't play out from the back. Well, you've stopped him doing it for two years because you've just told him to kick it longer at 10, 11, 12 years of age. And now you want him to all of a sudden, you watch Edison and now all of a sudden that's what you want. So it doesn't work like that. You know, from, from my experience, and I'm sure Mace is the same, you have to have a logical process throughout your academy that you stick with and you don't, you know, deviate away from the plan. And you understand it that by the time they get to a certain age, hopefully they should be able to, one, execute all the passes. But more importantly, they execute them technically. You know, they can tactically see the passes as well because it's okay having somebody who can technically do it. If they can't see the passes and see the, the spaces to exploit, it's basically going to be null and void for you. I mean, I don't know what you think, Mace. Yeah, I, I mean, what's, what's really big for me and probably one of the most effective strategies I've seen used to take the pressure off is as, as a coach is is to take any blame for any mistakes away from the player and put it on the coach so you, you make it really really clear that this is our style of play this is how we want you to play um and if you carry that out and it doesn't go right and it goes wrong that's our fault because we've asked you to play in that way but what you've tried to do is play the right way you've you've you've, you've tried to play how we've asked you to play now that isn't that isn't a young player's fault because they've walked into an environment where this this is our style of play. These are our principles. Um, this is how we play the game when you come and play for us at this club. Um, so yeah, you have to you have to fit into that. Um, so I think to take that that element of blame is is away from the player is is crucial. Um, and just on on the point of um giving the goalkeepers a really broad experience I, i'm a firm believer in, and having worked at, uh, at club academy level all the way through to senior i've seen goalkeepers go through pathways and i've been guilty of it where you you coach goalkeepers in a way that you think is going to um make them succeed at your club playing the style that you play but actually along the pathway um for, for, for the majority of goalkeepers at some point they they may have to go out on loan um at some point they they might not make it at your club and they have to go go on to another club elsewhere and perhaps play a different style um they might come away with us internationally and be required to play a slightly different style to what they play at their club i i truly believe that as a coach you have a duty to to give them a really broad experience so if if your if your style is to play out the back um don't neglect teaching the goalkeepers and, and helping them have the tools to be able to play a direct ball into the nine or, or a ball in, in, in behind to, be, to, to play beyond the back lines. Because when they do go out on loan and they, and they have to play that style and they can't do it, what happens is they, get, they, they come back because they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't do it at that level sustainably. Um, and, and then you have to pick the goalkeeper back up and try and rebuild. So I would say um, goalkeepers from the younger goalkeepers might not have the physical capabilities to do it um but th there might be exceptions to that rule so i would say still give them the option so still get them getting their head up and looking because at, at some point during their their development they will be able to play that ball so sure. don't get that fixed mindset of this is all i can do at this point um i think okay really uh, and one final thing for, from you two guys at the moment working with the national teams in your relevant age groups what about how do you integrate with the with the, the coaching staff? Because this is very, very heavily focused and we're shining a light uh, on the goalkeeper and, and the way that Sam's describing about the age groups and the way we'd coach it. How do you guys collaborate with the outfield coaches and, and effectively the head coach of the team at the moment? Do you get involved in session design, session planning? Is it uh, a bit of you and them together, especially when we're talking about playing out from the back? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think like on camp, and I'm sure you'll you'll be the same, Mace. Obviously, the planning meetings beforehand will will be around a certain theme. So if a theme is around high pressing, then that's a perfect opportunity for us to try and work on build from the back. So we have like in possession and out possession specialist coaches, as well as the goalkeeping coach being a specialist coach. So sometimes when it's all about high pressing, that's an opportunity for us to flip that, and the goalkeeper can be working on trying to play through that high press. So You've got your out of possession coach working aggressively on pressing triggers from from an out of possession point of view. And then your in possession coach and your goalkeeping coach will be working on trying to beat that. And you're almost going against each other as a coach. You're almost trying to, and then it's actually looking like a game. Your, your training session is looking like a game. It's thought out beforehand. Um, it's planned beforehand, and then you're seeing it come to fruition within your training session, and you can adapt and change how, however you see fit. So that's my experiences from from being in, in the international setup with that um, is you're all connected together and it's not the goalkeeping coach, um, you know, designing his session and going over on, on another pitch for 40, you know, 40 minutes and then coming over and then joining a session that's disjointed. Everything is linked together between between the whole staff. So you all you're all coaching the same thing or you're coaching against each other to get the highest returns possible. Similarly with you, Mark. Yeah, I think um, it, it moves us nicely into the next section um, in terms of the role of the goalkeeper coach. Um, and I, I think it gives us a really good opportunity to go into the, um, the, the probably the intricacies, intricacies of it and perhaps mine and Sam's experience of doing it at both club and international level. Um, I, I think certainly from um, a point of view of relationships, um, it, I, I think it's the most important thing. So... As, as a goalkeeper coach, I think historically we've, um, we've perhaps been quite separate from the rest of the coaching staff in the way we approach delivering sessions. Um, and we're, we're certainly coming around to a way of working where it, it's a lot more joined up. And, and to be able to do that, um, I think, is, is, is crucial in the sense of um, having the relationships where I, I can have an open conversation, I can challenge and I can feel really comfortable in doing that. Um, so if we t if we talk about my ability to um, go and talk to a, a manager about a style of play and, and how an opposition might um, might try and, and stop us playing in the way we want to play, um, I have to be really comfortable with having that that conversation, which might challenge someone else's way of thinking. And as a goalkeeper coach, I have to be really com comfortable and confident in doing that. Um, so I, I would say. Um, the, the relationship part and the respect part is really crucial. And, and Sam, would you say the same from, from a club point of view, from your experiences working with senior football? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, the two experiences that I've had um, where when I first got into coaching, which was, you know, 12, 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, it was very much goalkeeper coach on your own in the corner, come over when you're ready. And that has evolved so much in 12 years and it's only going to evolve even more. So my, my previous experiences at club level, was, um, you know, my first experience of going into first team football, I was in charge of the set plays. I had a mic in my ear where somebody was giving me information from above tactically that I had to then relay to the rest of the staff while the manager could get on with what he needed to get on with, um, take care of substitutions, you know. And, you know, if somebody wasn't in the right set play position, then that was my role to, one, identify that and get the information onto the pitch. So... It wasn't just sat in your technical area and watched the game unfold. You had so many different things to to, to look out for and, and to be that support staff. You're not just the goalkeeping specialist. You are support staff. You're part of that 4-5 um, team there as well. And then linking back to, you know, when I, when I went back to the under-23s, I ended up being the assistant coach of the 23s for, you know, a quite a long period of time. So it was dealing with players on a daily basis while integrating the goalkeepers at the same time. So... That role of the goalkeeping coaches is, is not only evolved um, over time; it's evolving even more. And them experiences, I would say, in the club has definitely given me um, a platform now to step into this environment internationally and be comfortable working within that way, which is, which is basically a requirement to be an international coach, a goalkeeper coach. I, I think we've seen um, you know various ways of goalkeeping coaches work. I think you're right; you, you hit the nail on the head. And from experience, when I started playing. I wouldn't even see the goalkeeper till a Thursday until he did an 11 v 11. <laughs> goalkeeper coach. Um, and, and, you know, he, he, to, to exaggerate that point further, sometimes on a match day, they'd be playing the balls back to the goalkeeper 
to the wrong foot and the goalkeeper said, we've been working on this all week. And we were like, well, we didn't know. So outfield players didn't actually know what the goalkeeper was working on. Yeah. Uh, times are changing for the better. And I think we've seen that in other specialist coaches. You look at Alan Russell now with the England seniors and working specifically with the strikers. We are getting more position specific in terms of the detail and the content required at every individual position on the pitch. And I think the goalkeeper, as they are in such a good position to see the entire pitch and the lens that they've got on the focus, why not utilise them? And especially the goalkeeping coach who tends to be like you two have got such a vast experience of working in clubs and now the international scene to, to also help out with everything else that is going out on the pitch. Yeah, I think obviously with on camp, and I'm sure, Mace, you're exactly the same. You know, the out-possession coach will be working on maybe high pressing and then he'll he'll say to me look I, i'll concentrate on the midfields in the front three you need to sort out the goalkeeper in the back four so your level of detail is the goalkeeping coach needs to be right not only to your goalkeeper but also to this back four so you're working together as a coaching staff on one thing so the level of detail you can get into 11 players gets ramped up because now you've got you've got two coaches going to 11 players or you know three coaches to 11 players rather than one coach trying to coach 22 players and you're just looking after your goalkeeper. So yeah. um, the demands now on the goalkeeping coaches is is a lot higher. And, and you know what, the, the outfield coaches, from my experience working working at England, is, you know, they, they lean on you a lot and and you need to be ready for that. And they're not they're not afraid to give you certain responsibilities with the outfield player. They don't they don't just see you as a goalkeeping coach. They see you as support staff. Yeah, I think that's really important, Sam, and, and and I think it's it's a brilliant step forward. And I think actually, uh, when I go into the clubs from a, from a coach education point of view, I'm I'm seeing a lot more of that now. I'm seeing a lot more of the collaboration between goalkeeper coaches and outfield coaches. Um, and probably one of the things that I've learned along the way is you, you you have to put ego aside at times as well, because I think when you step on the training pitch, it's easy to it's easy to want to be the voice. Um, want to be the one that's giving the messages, want want to be the one that players come to, that people on the outside see is delivering the messages. And and probably along the way, I've learned more and more that actually who's who's best placed in that moment or who has the best expertise in that area of the field to actually deliver the message in that moment. Um, and actually um, really taking any ego aside. And I think, uh, like, like Sam said, I think you, you look at the, the, from us, from an international point of view, that that's really evident that that happens um, from from um, foundation phase, youth development phase, all the way all the way through to senior phase. That that happens, um, and I think it's a really a, a really key um, progression, really. Um, and and actually, it might just be that your contribution as a goalkeeper coach is observing and seeing, and having the ability and the relationship and understanding that in a session you can go and stand next to the manager or stand next to the other coach and just have a conversation while the session's going on and saying, I'm just seeing this. It might just be worth picking up next time you you, 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 um, you interact with the players or stop the session. Or um, so, so having the ability to have those, those relationships where you can be open, you can share ideas on the pitch. Um, and I think we're seeing that progress more and more um, in, a, in a positive direction. Um, in terms of, you said about session design and collaboration, um, it, it's probably one of the, I, I think we do it really well now within the women's seniors. And um, I, I would really challenge coaches to say, um, how well do you do it in your club? So the, the conversation when uh, you, you're designing a possession practice, the conversation when you're designing a, a, a build the attack practice in terms of, right, um, from a goal kick, this is how we're going to play. Um, in, whatever, in whatever session design you choose to create as an outfield coach, do you sit down with your with the other staff? Do you sit down with with the assistant coach or with the goalkeeper coach and talk through the session? Put it up on a screen or on the board. Talk through the the space that you're going to use. Talk through the players you're going to use. Talk through the the, the um, constraints of the session, um, and and be prepared to be open and be challenged by the other staff. Not to not not to make you look silly. Not to make your session look um, look bad but actually to really give the players the best opportunity to carry out the game plan on game day in the most effective way. Um, so, so if we are saying, do you know what, our strategy in this game is to play beyond because of their high line, are we creating sessions and pitch sizes that are big enough and long enough 
where there's it affords that opportunity to be able to play in behind because if we're not we're potentially missing an opportunity um and i would say that the the most time consuming and most difficult part of that whole process of that collaboration is the very start so when you first start having those conversations and challenging each other it, it can be tough and there can be some difficult conversations and some heated debates but what happens is you start to influence from a from a goalkeeping point of view your your views around what it looks right, right from the goalkeeper. You start to hear from the outfield coach what they're seeing from the outfield point of view, and you actually start to design really effective sessions. And the further down the line you get with it, it gets easier and easier. And what you find is next time the outfield coach presents a session, for example, that they've designed, they've already thought about some of the things that you would challenge because you've been having those conversations over time. Um, so I would I would really say that that's a massive massive point to to get out in terms of working together as a team for the player and for the team not not for yourself as a coach. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Sam. I think we're um, almost there. So j just leaves me finally to to come onto one more slide and we'll just consolidate on what we've discussed on the workshop. Um, We've given you hopefully a fascinating and intriguing insight into the way that Mark and Sam work at the, the international level, uh, blended with some experience from clubs working right through the men's and women's game and across all the age phases. I suppose the next challenge for you in terms of your learning and, and applying all that knowledge is, is it going to change your thought process? If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's for you to consider. We just want to make you more curious and to consider all the points that have been raised today in our discussions. How can you or will you apply those with your players to benefit them and to pick up on the last point to perhaps benefit those other coaches that you work with at your football clubs? So to finalise, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Laura, behind the scenes. Uh, hopefully that's proved valuable because I could stay on for another hour. I found it that fascinating. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for your time. Thank you.